start streaming. <laughs> Well, it says it's good now. You can certainly help a lot too. Uh, this, as a reminder of when the 
this occurs, this doesn't happen like when you, down, when you have a page downloaded on your machine like it would with JavaScript. This happens when somebody goes, requests a page, your server goes and does this. Um, you can also, as you'd expect, do looping. So here, uh, note that I have an um, unordered loop on the outside. And then the JSP part, we just do a basic for loop. Like the if statement, we have, um, we use brackets. If you don't use brackets, um, sometimes it will barely work, yeah, yes. Hi, so, um, for like the, can you go back to the previous slide real quick? So, you're saying that the server does the logic and then mm -hmm. just sends back, just sends, it, like if this if statement, um, like was false, it would not send that little piece of HTML over to you. Um, yeah, that's okay. correct. So for just, I'll just do a little basic timing diagram up here. What you have is, so let's just say this is the client, the client right back here, and then you have like the server. So client does goes and uh, maybe we want to you know, get a page dot js and then this then it goes and execute Sends back that, um, so all that stuff has been executed, and then over here on the client, that's when we would run any JavaScript code if we have any. You don't need JavaScript to do the uh, part three, uh, but you might want to use it, and that's why it's just listed as an optional prerequisite. Um, and then also, okay, um, going, I guess on to the next example. Um, you have just you know, your basic Java for loop. Um, and then interesting also to note in you know, this part, as compared to the if statement, you also render the variable i. And if you notice that, it just has a little equal sign after the percent, unlike uh, most of the other JSP stuff. And that will put the i in there, or uh, render it like it would be just two straight and puts it in the HTML. So, um, what that would look like is just an ordered list with first item, second item, as numbers. So, one item, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. So, the, the equal sign puts the value of the variable versus, like, the, otherwise it would put the, like, the literal i? Otherwise it wouldn't do anything, it would just be like Java code. We need something to tell it, you know, go do two string and put it in my HTML. And that's basically what that uh, does. Um, just think of it as just, it just calls two string and puts it in your HTML. Um, and... Okay, so that is just um, some basic uh, HTML. The OL tells it that it's an ordered list. So it would be one, two, three, four, five, um, so on. And then the li is just another HTML statement to say that it's the uh, for each element in the list. Um, question. And we're gonna have a right now. 
All right, so one of the most important things, obviously, in this project are going to be forms, because you know you want your user to be able to input and output, um, things like logging in and logging out and all that. Um, so for that, when you're uh, creating um, a form, uh, it creates like this implicit request variable that from there, when, when it receives this form, it can just get all the things out of it. So for example, you see on the bottom, we have you know, a form and an HTML, and it actually points to a JSP page. So in this JSP page, you can just call inside of your Java code a request.get parameter, and then whatever you called it. See, in this case, we call it name. Um, and it'll just out, um, print it out for you, so you can store it as a string um, in your Java code if you want to do some things with it, or if you want to, in this case, you know how much your HTML, you can just use like the percent equals again. And um, yeah, so it makes it really easy to get those values out. Yeah? So the form action, and the form, if I remember correctly, is when like something happens, it sends an action event or something similar to that, and then it would basically go to that hyper, it would go to that hyperlink, and then ask the server for a website. Mm -hmm. It would come back with hello, and then the parameter, or whatever it got, right? So yes. Yeah, so I mean, typically you'd also have like a submit button or something in your form, and then when they click that, it would um, yeah go to the example that JSP, and um, it would. You know, just do whatever that page told it to. So if that page just rendered another basic HTML page, it would do that. Or if it, in the, like in this case, um, played with the parameters it was given, it would you know display those. Um, and then you know, obviously you get two completely different pages depending on you know if you have like a statement saying like hey if you know they're putting in a login and username that's filled in you know do, try to log them in or if they left it empty go back to that page and say hey left it empty. So you can do different things like that. Um, so one other important thing is a session attribute. Um, this allows you to assist. Um, certain variables across many pages for your user. So, um, for example, uh, it's like a request, but it's one that you can set manually without using forms. So, in your Java code, you can just say, hey, session um, dot set attribute, and then the first one's the key, and the second one is the value. Um, and so, that way, you know, if the user's logged in and you want to store their login name, or you want to store, you know, hey, this person is an admin, or something like that, you can um, just put it in the session attribute, and then on each page, you need to check that. You can just say, you can, at the bottom, you know, okay, say session dot get attribute user provide a key and it'll return it. Um, I believe you can actually store objects in there. I don't know how great that is, but I think when I did the project, I stored like a login object, but you can also just store, you know, strings and booleans as well. Um, and so then just for our um, project, the basic project structure, um, each of you will have a login on the Georgia um, server, and it'll be the same username and password that you're using for your databases. Um, in there, you'll, all you'll find is a public h underscore HTML folder, and that's where you're going to be doing everything, all of your coding is going to go in there. So directly in that public.html underscore HTML folder, you can put all your JSP files. So when someone goes to the URL that we'll show you in a sec, um, they'll, you know, you just put like an index.jsp folder file in there, and that'll be the one that's like by default loaded. And from there, you can provide, um, you know, relative links to throughout there that you include in there. Um, and so that's where you typically put your JSP, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, any of those type of files will be directly in that public underscore HTML folder. Um, so if you want to include Java code, which is probably the smart thing to do, so that way you don't have to rewrite everything from uh, phase two, you can just reuse a lot of the Java classes that you've used in phase two. Um, you just put it in the public underscore HTML slash web in slash classes. And then from there, like we showed you earlier, you can use the import statement to say, hey, import these files, and it'll be, they'll be in there um, once you create those class files. Um, one thing to know, uh, when you're copying back and forth between your machine and then the remote server, don't just um, copy and overwrite the public underscore HTML folder, because that has special permissions in order to run on the server. So if you overwrite it, it'll break everything. So make sure to only like, be copying and pasting um, files inside of that folder. So just as a heads up, you know, when you, just so you're clear when it breaks, you know why. I think that's it. We are going to show you an example. Roy, um, I should probably should show them how to log in. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So, um, I know you just said it, but I have to make sure that I yeah, caught sure. it. So, um, when we create a JSP file in that folder, we only copy that JSP like within that, so we can't like have something in a different folder and copy it to that JSP to that public HTML folder, right? Is that what you're saying? So what I'm saying is like, don't on your machine make your own public HTML folder, and when you want to replace it, copy 
delete the public HTML folder from the server and replace it with your own. Oh, okay. Only replace the stuff inside of there because that public HTML folder has itself has special permissions in order to be able to run on the server. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. I was just wondering, does JSP support multiple lines of Java code, or is it just like a single line? Oh, no, you can um, intersperse as many of those as you want. Um, I try to keep the examples and everything on these slides like real simple, but you can just you just add in more of those little like special brackets, things, as many of those as you need. And in one of the examples I had, it showed, like in the um, if statement example, it had a couple of lines within a single one of those brackets in case you needed to do some more complicated logic. So that allows you know we're able to say hey if, if, if 
they haven't done it yet, no, if they have a logged in, show a login page, or you know, let them in using the password if they have, and then you can do some other stuff based on that. Um, and so this, this is a you know decent little example, it shows you how you can use it, and then it, it shows you how you can use like regular Java files um, in there as well. So it gives you a good place to start. Um, so a lot of what we're doing though is going to be uh, importing our uh, files that we wrote for phase two yeah. and uh, just making method calls from our JSP files to those. Mm -hmm. uh, right? Yeah. Okay. So here's another example. So you search for because to user one. So you just ask you the query <coughs> and get a result from the database and the from the page. So log uh, So you can see, so how as import um, equals CS5530 dot and then star, that's getting everything from the CS5530 folder, which is, if you look in public HTML, in um, web and then in classes, it has this uh, 55, CS5530 folder. And so by saying import CS5530 dot star, it's getting all the Java files that are inside of there. So, um, or actually the class files that are inside of there. And then that way you can directly just call, hey, I need this, um, Function from this class, and then you're just use that directly in your GSP. And it automatically knows to look in the web dash folder. Like yeah. it just knows that. In, in classes, in web into classes, it knows that that's where you should put your own class files for your job. Something that is important also though to note in here is that you notice it does have dot class. You do need to put your um, all of your code in compiler format, either as like a jar file or as dot class files in here. And it has in the readme um, an easy way just to compile everything in the uh, classes directory. Uh, but you do need to compile that before you will be able to use your uh, job code in there. Yeah, so hopefully you know you're able to, when you're finishing phase two, you're able to just have all these methods in Java that do all the different requirements that we just talked about in the project. And then uh, basically you're really just about writing the web pages and calling those um, those appropriate methods from your Java classes and you can explain the permission. So one thing I would recommend for this is um, don't worry about making it pretty until like maybe the end if you wanted to make it pretty that point. Just try and do um, some basic HTML forms and the real basic um, outputting of the data. Just use basic HTML tags. Don't do any CSS and don't use any JavaScript. And then just add that stuff in later if you really want to um, make it look nice that way. Because really we don't, you won't get extra points or anything for make it look nice, it's just for fulfilling the basic requirements. So do that stuff first. Yeah, we don't care about how it looks, just how it works. And we also don't care about security, so don't, don't, don't worry about storing your passwords as strings or anything like that, or letting people, you know, don't have to worry about SQL injection or any of that. So we're not, we're not trying to, you know, break your code and be like, uh, -huh. yeah, we, we just care if it works and have those requirements. With it, so that's how we're great. Any other questions? <coughs> cool. Thanks, guys. Oh, sorry. So then we need to have both the build files and the build files? Or can we just um, have the one? You just need the build ones. Um, probably when you're working on this, so you might want to have the source ones in there because then that way you don't have to go back to your old project. Um, that way, if you need to make changes to your source, if you find an issue is wrong or you didn't complete all the requirements of the first one, you can find it in here. So I think that's why they have them here. But yeah, you only need the build ones. Yeah. Um, this is actually a question about phase two. Um, I just I wanted to try turning in uh, the project yesterday, and both for the URL and over SSH, the, it said the class name CS5530 didn't exist. Um, I don't, so right now I can't actually submit it. I just wondered if anyone else had this problem or successfully submitted it. Like if we have like available dates, for instance, or if we have like something that has a range, 
it will only be within that range, right? It won't like be outside that range, correct? Yeah, so like we're not going to be going there trying to put in a bathroom and make sure you handle it's on a full, good format or like where you expect it to be and try and put a straight line. We just care about what you guys think. It would be nice though if you do um, dates and stuff. If like if you print out and put in a date in this format, that would be nice. <laughs> but, and then yeah, also like as far as range stuff, I mean we're not going to be testing it as far as like trying to break your code, but if like the requirements specifically state in a way that there might be like a column um, constraint or something like that, we, we probably will check for that. But as far as like trying to break your code in ways that aren't certain requirements. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah. um, this question was oh, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry, uh, I didn't. Almost quick. Uh, this question was actually asked twice on Canvas, and I've read both of Fei's replies. But um, it's about, like, for example, reservations and whether we can just um, whether we have to do a shopping cart thing where we keep like a list of all the reservations they've made and then send them all at once. <coughs> Um, he gave an answer that kind of suggested that we would be allowed to just do it one at a time. Like, they fill out the reservation, we send it to the database. Like, is, is that okay if we do that, or do we have to do this shopping cart thing? I'm not sure. I don't know what they're um, I think I can clarify that. Uh, so I think what Fei Fei was talking more about, and I think what the question would be is, like, do you have to actually pers because like on Amazon.com, if I log in on my phone, and if I log in on my PC, the shopping cart will be the same. No, you don't have to do that on this. Um, you can just, like, and like for the phase two, you could just store it in Java. But then it should um, be stored in Java and work like a shopping cart. Uh, send off all of the, you know, insert all of the reservations in there. It doesn't have to be in one transaction though, so which I don't think we've covered transactions yet. But so like if one of them for some reason failed, that's okay. Just like you know, keep trying to go on, but um, you don't have to like reject all the reservations if one of them fails. Yeah. Uh, for like feedbacks on uh, how you rate a feedback, like. Uh, I saw that we, it was like zero one two for like not useful to useful. Uh, do we assume that you would put zero one two, or do you put in not useful, kind of useful, useful? Like, do you put in the string or the number as the end user? So I would think in the database you'd store a number. Well, in the database, right? I'm talking like what I'm looking for, the, for is input. Yeah, for the input, you can design it however you want the user to be. I mean, you know, you think the user probably more um, understand useful, not useful type um, structure. But I mean, if you put zero one two, I guess it's technically right. But what, I, what I would probably suggest as the lazy and I think best option would be just say, you know, put in, put it in like in when you're telling them, you know, whatever in your console app, or like zero um, good, or zero um, not useful, one, or, you know, whatever, just put it in and then just expect them to type in zero, one, or two, but clarify what that is <coughs> in your program. Okay, then. <laughs> Anything else? Cool. All right.